And I got to the point where I felt like my learning curve had kind of flattened off a bit and I like to feel uncomfortable. And uh, I felt also that we'd reached a, a point in time, a point in history in a way, where machine learning and everything around artificial intelligence was really gathering steam in a sort of practical uh, application uh, type of way. And I wanted to put myself in the middle of that. I had a great opportunity at Accenture to continue my career there. Welcome back to another edition of Crisis to Creation here on Mentory TV. I am Patricia Kakubekali, your host. And before talking to our amazing guest today, let me say thank you. Thank you for joining the community. Thank you for staying curious. Also, your productivity, your comments, your liking and sharing, so hugely appreciated. Now, today, we are going to talk to Craig Fenton. Craig Fenton is Director of Operations and Strategy at Google UK Ireland Ireland and Southern Europe, and he's apart from his day job, such an incredible man. I mean, he's a YouTuber, an author, and TED speaker. He's a mentor and also an angel investor. So much to talk about, apart from being a great family man, having your own record label, Craig. So good to have you here on the show. I think we have a lot to talk about with you this morning. Thanks for having me, Patricia. Nice to be here. <laughs> you know, the first thing that struck me about you is not necessarily your fabulous title and position at Google, but was really the trajectory of your career, because it started right at the other end of the world. <laughs> we are sitting now in the European area, and you were, you're coming from down under, and in another profession entirely, i.e. in the law and barrister business. Tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I grew up in New Zealand, so I'm Kiwi originally. I've been living in Europe now for uh, two, almost 23 years, so this is very much home. I live in the UK. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I had a, a wonderful uh, childhood uh, growing up in New Zealand, very isolated uh, country. Uh, at the time I was young, it was a population of three million people. It was pre-internet. You had to sit on a plane for uh, about 10 hours to reach a country other than Australia, um, and in many ways, that was splendid isolation, very outdoorsy. Uh, and uh, like many, uh, you know, uh, of, of my uh, peer group, um, I ended uh, my school and I started university. And I, I studied commerce and law. I did a, a two degrees at the time, um, not particularly through any um, deep thought. Uh, actually, it was because my mate Mike was doing that degree. And I thought, well, if it's good enough for Mike, I'll do that too and uh, ended up following the, the law side. I, I became a barrister. I was a court lawyer. I did commercial litigation for about six years, which was wonderful. Well, I think it's so funny you should say that. Well, my friend studied this, so I thought it was cool. The reason why I ended up uh, studying in the UK, because back then I had a, a boyfriend in the UK who said, hey, why don't you study over here? <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, <laughs> why not? And then as soon as I came over, I said, ah, okay, no more boyfriend, just university, <laughs> and went on. <laughs> But uh, I think what is interesting is, of course, um, being a barrister and lawyer aligns your mind in a very strategic way because you have to const constantly um, negotiate, uh, argue and convince. To what extent does this part of your career, uh, the first part of your career, really feed into what you're doing today? Yeah, very much so. I pull on those skills all the time. Um, the, the practice of law is really about as assembling and sort of ingesting a vast array of facts, um, applying rules to those facts and figuring out um, what follows. You know, it's a, a little bit like a mathematical formula in a way, not as precise. And in the courtroom, it's uh, it's about uh, persuasion. Uh, it's it's about presenting uh, an argument in a in a in a neutral but uh, compelling way, and uh, convincing a, a judge or a jury. Uh, to find in the favour of the argument you're making. And I think the, um, uh, there are many parallels, right, uh, in, in terms of deal structuring and understanding how a contract works and the anatomy of, of the law. I, I use that all the time, um, particularly in my record label, actually. Uh, and um, if you think about the, the skill of advocacy in a courtroom, it's really analogous to uh, selling, right? The best way to sell uh, is not to, actually, it's to listen. Uh, first and foremost, you need to do a lot of that in, in the courtroom. 
but also you need to be completely vulnerable and present a very balanced uh, point of view. And uh, otherwise, you know, people don't like being uh, told what to think, do they? Uh, so um, you need to be quite balanced and, uh, and measured in the way that you present something, explore the good, the bad and the ugly of, of your point of view. Uh, but lead them inexorably to a, uh, a decision that uh, you, you want. And, and really, that's the process of sales as well. Yes, and I think the sales, what you were just saying, you, you sell through your ears, not your mouth, is extremely mm. important. And I think that comes into decision-making as well. And whereas you, as, as a lawyer or a barrister in general, you have to gather as many facts as possible, but our way that we have to navigate to a very uncertain life, you cannot have 100% of the facts, right? That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's uh, talk a little bit more about what advantages anybody could actually have if you really completely change. So you have the law background, which is always good to have, not only for strategy, just simply because you know what your framework is of anything you want to establish. But then you started uh, your MBA, and then you stayed in the UK and went into business and into into corporate consultancy. What does that part of perhaps business analytics give give you uh, what does it give you in uh, in terms of um yeah how to approach anything in terms of business processes well i think uh, you know the law was for me it was intellectually very interesting intellectually demanding but not particularly creatively demanding and i felt that was something uh, missing there about sort of uh, wanting to express my creativity in some way and of course in business we call creativity innovation don't we um, and I, I didn't really know how to do that. I wanted to, uh, I knew I didn't want to be a career lawyer. I wanted to get into business. Uh, so that's what brought me to the UK. I figured I'd go and uh, retrain and, and more importantly, probably rebrand. I uh, did an MBA at London Business School and then you know, joined the world of uh, consultancy. Most people in my cohort either went into consultancy or they went into um, investment banking, at least in London. I went down the consultancy route because I still really didn't know uh, exactly what was super interesting to me, what industry, and consultancy is a great way to do some business tourism. Uh, in, a, in effect, you get to work with a lot of different companies in different uh, problems in different geographies, in, in my case, uh, and figure out um, you know, how to help them, but also you know, how it all works. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to explore the breadth of business uh, and also express uh, the creative the creativity that's required in problem solving in a very sort of fuzzy, ambiguous environment. And is that actually different from sector to sector? Oh, uh, totally different from sector to sector. I spent most of my time in media, telecommunications, and high tech. Uh, but actually, even in that, those sort of three short phrases, there's a world of difference. You've got everything from cable operators to the big mobile phone companies like Vodafone and fixed line like Deutsche Telekom uh, through to uh, media sets, you know, the cable operator or the television uh, channel of Silvio uh, Berlusconi in, in, uh, in Italy uh, to, uh, to uh, so, you know, some of the media publishers uh, at that stage. Um, so big, big, big range even there. So and that means it was almost natural to join Google? I wouldn't say almost natural. I mean, I spent a long time in consulting. I was there for, um, I was with a company called Accenture, great company, by the way. And I was there for uh, about 16 years, uh, though I had eight different roles. I, I kept changing my role pretty much every two to three years. And that, that, remains, uh, that remains a rule uh, for, for me, a personal rule uh, today. I like to keep changing and like, uh, I like the variety. But I was there for uh, about 16 years, got the wonderful opportunity to work um, across Europe. Uh, so I had a lot of time in the UK, had a couple of years in Germany, a couple of years in France and Benelux, did some work in uh, Italy, Central Europe, uh, the Middle East. I had a long stint in Saudi Arabia in the UAE. I worked in Turkey, Russia, Poland, uh, a little bit in the Nordics and Spain. So I really saw uh, what bus how business worked in, in, in a lot of different ways. And I guess the golden thread that excited me through that journey was um, seeing the wonderful uh, opportunity as well as challenge that technology brought uh, to business and more importantly to the customers that those businesses uh, served. Uh, and it's such a fast moving thing. You know, we never really become expert 
in that domain. It just keeps changing more and more rapidly uh, every year. And I got to the point where I felt like my learning curve had kind of flattened off a bit and I like to feel uncomfortable. And uh, I felt also that we'd reached a, a point in time, a point in history in a way, where machine learning and everything around artificial intelligence was really gathering steam in a sort of practical uh, application uh, type of way. And I wanted to put myself in the middle of that. I had a great opportunity at Accenture to continue my career there. Um, but instead of sort of rushing towards that, I took a step back, had a think um, about what really excited me and uh, felt it was time for a change. So I wrote a, a little short list. Google was one company I had on it. I think I had two others. And uh, as, as, uh, you know, as things work out, you know, luck, timing, and a little bit of competence, um, you know, landed me where I am now. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I wonder, you know, because the red thread that I kind of seem to detect with you, you, you're constantly wanting to learn and expand. You know, one of my motto, you just mentioned variety and change. My, my motto at the Mentory TV is stay curious, you know, live your life as if it was the first day, not the last day, the first day, open eyes and ears and really curious about anything and to develop. And Perhaps this is why I ended up also a technology uh, fan, if not junkie, because technology and its velocity of development always stimulates, always asks you to kind of get out of your comfort zone and adopt new ways of thinking, uh, which which stimulates me because I'm also, if I, you know, I get very easily bored. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hence also mentoring TV came around or like, come around, I want to talk to interesting, challenging people uh, and share that, of course, through the platform. But but I love that kind of attitude because uh, in a company like Google, which thrives on innovation, which you could call the innovation hub, uh, that must be that must be a very inspiring, but at the same time, it needs to be a business. So how do you not only continue innovating and generating innovation in bigger companies, right? Uh, and at the same time, structure it in a way that it still has processes, um, go to market strategy and it stays a viable business. Yeah, great question, Patricia. I mean, the, here's, here's the thing. No one is entitled to be in business and, and that includes Google. Um, and, and that, you know, history is full of examples of, of companies that were really on top of their game and, and, and faded uh, into, into obsolescence. So innovation is really the lifeblood of any business, you know, Google uh, included, but not only uh, Google, of course. And I think the, you know, we did a study at Google that's been well sort of publicized uh, in the press about what makes the difference between great teams and good teams. And it turns out that the number one difference is psychological safety. Uh, so creating that environment where it's kind of safe to be a little bit playful and, and uh, indulge in, in your sort of inner, inner child and experiment and, um, you know, have the courage to try stuff and trip over and fail and pick yourself up and uh, iterate, uh, you know, wind it down or scale it in a different direction. Um, so... Uh, creating that culture is not really about size, it's about psychological safety. It's the, uh, it's the environment where people feel that they can bring their whole selves, their full selves, not pretend to be anything other than they are. Uh, they can express their competence uh, in whatever discipline that they're doing, know that their colleagues have got their back and know it's okay, it's almost a badge of honour, to get it wrong. Uh, because if you're getting it wrong and, you, and you're failing, it's a good sign that you're pushing the boundary. No, I, I so agree. And uh, the culture of failure, you know, I think I think in a corporate world, it needs to be a clearly communicated um, thing that may happen. And if it is an okay to fail culture, people immediately relax because we are all human. But let me kind of backtrack because what I'm hearing is, and please correct me, Craig, if I'm wrong, is you at Google have, the culture of empowerment, of trust, and just say authentically what you think because it all adds to the pot, which then is part of the creative process. That's right. And there's a number of dimensions to that. So first of all, it's a very flat company. There's not really a, a high hierarchy. Uh, if, I, if I wanted to challenge Sundar, our CEO, on something, that would be just fine and welcomed uh, by him. And, and, and that's true uh, throughout the company. So it's a very... Uh, flat, uh, flat culture. It's a very collaborative culture. So uh, teamwork is the norm. Um, there are very 
few roles in Google that are sort of essentially uh, sole uh, operators. Uh, as I said before, we're um, you know we try to create an environment that's uh, that's stimulating, that's that's playful, where it's uh, where it's okay to uh, to trip up. There's a lot of experimentation. There's a lot of piloting, and that really is something that comes from the software world, right? When you launch a piece of software, it's generally an alpha, and then it's a beta, and then it's you know it scales into uh, production at a more mass uh, level, and that ethos sort of runs uh, runs throughout the uh, runs throughout the company. And I and I, <laughs> I think it was the first time I walked into Google here in Zurich, and I think they have about three thousand employees. I know Stefan Erhard very well, uh, and also Chris Fong from Xublo.co. So they were also on the show on Mentory TV. And I walked in with my sixteen-year-old daughter, and she was like. Oh my God. Oh my God. It's like, you know, it's a playground. It is colorful. It's beautiful. It is, you can have a mindful moment in a quiet room. You can have a playful moment doing ping pong or whatever, you know. And I think this kind of, even on a neurological level, because people think that just because you're not doing anything and you seem idle, you are idle. But there is so much actually generating in the back of our brains, which I think this kind of approach really pulls out that, that Google has. Absolutely, yeah. And the Zurich office is a great office. You know, you walk in, the first thing that you see, I think, is a gondola, uh, which has actually been built into a meeting room. Um, it's great food. We do a lot of engineering, actually, in, in Zurich. It's a big, you know, a lot of people think, oh, this is a Californian company. Not at all. It's a very global company. Uh, and actually, um, our, one of our biggest uh, engineering bases in the world is, is uh, indeed in Zurich. In Zurich, and it is really fun. And they give you food 24-7. So you and I liking to feel out of the comfort zone. Our intermittent fasting is definitely being challenged there 24-7. I'd, I'd find it very hard to say no all the time. But let's stay for a while, if we may, Craig, with um, technology, technological innovation. Because I had a look what what Google is really at the moment also pushing for. And then I would like to get more into uh, what you are doing, all the other great stuff you're doing. And that is, they look at big data and analytics, um, everything as a service, of course, AI, which I thought was very interesting. So let, let me ask you, where do you think the next, if there is going to be like a disruptive innovation, is going to come from? Is it the data analytics or is it really the artificial intelligence as an augmentation to us, not a replacement to us humans? Uh, definitely an augmentation. We've, we, we very much uh, believe that uh, that technology is an enabler, um, and uh, uh, and you know I, I can I can kind of talk talk about uh, the um, you know the digital age um, till the cows come home. But the uh, you know technology is is in and of itself is is not actually valuable. Um, you know, there's nothing of value inherent value in technology. It's the application of technology that really matters. And the application is something that uh, we dream up, uh, <laughs> we people. Uh, and um, AI is very much part of all of our lives. If you use a search engine, uh, if you go onto YouTube or one of the other video platforms, if you use Google Maps, if you search for a photo in your photo library, whether you're on iOS or Android, um, these are, uh, if you use Gmail and, uh, and, and you see how the spam filters work, these are all examples of real-life application of uh, a form of artificial intelligence that's sort of recognising patterns and applying them in helpful ways. So this is very much already part of our reality. Uh, I think it's becoming more and more helpful. Um, the uh, particularly exciting, I think, directions that you can take AI, and, and this is happening already, is, uh, is into the medical field. Um, for example, we've got um, algorithms that will help uh, physicians uh, spot um, early uh, signs of macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy. These are two eye conditions that are very treatable, but if you don't catch them early, they can make you blind. You know, that's a great example of, of applying um, AI in, in the direction of, of medical technology. Other algorithms that help uh, spot the early signs of a malignant uh, breast lump, breast cancer, uh, which is also a very treatable condition if it's if it's caught early. So that's a really exciting route. I think that's been well underway for some time, 
Um, B, I think the step change that's really exciting um, is quantum computing. And, and the reason I say that is, um, it, it is twofold. First of all, um, there was a, a fellow called Moore back in the 60s that, who predicted that uh, the uh, processing power and, uh, would double and the cost would halve in computing every year. Uh, and that's an exponential uh, curve. And indeed, it's followed more or less that pattern, which is why today, with petabytes and petabytes of data, we're able to actually apply um, AI in a useful way and, uh, and, and come up with the applications that we're able to do. That processing power and the cost of deploying it has reached such a stage. But it's also starting to flatten off. You know, we've reached the, uh, the laws of physics um, boundaries, if you like, of how small uh, and, uh, and how uh, heat powerful, controlled. Powerful, powerful uh, device can actually be. And how powerful you can be. Um, so the next stage beyond that is quantum computing, which instead of using a, a transistor that effectively is a one or a zero, you're using a thing that, that's called a qubit, and it um, taps into the uh, quantum principle of superposition, where uh, an element can be a one, a zero, or some sort of combination. And if you put a few of those together, that exponentially expands uh, the, uh, the computing power that you've got available. So, for example, we had a, a quantum computer uh, breakthrough, quantum supremacy breakthrough, um, not so long ago, but just over a year ago, uh, where uh, we had a, a controlled environment and a, and a quantum computer solved a mathematical equation in 200 seconds that would have taken the most powerful supercomputer available today 10,000 years. No just way. Just to give you a, no a, way. a, a fear. And, and the reason that's important, right, I'm geeking out a little bit with engineering stuff here, but the reason that's important is that the natural world around us is very, very complex. It's the most complex thing imaginable. And with, with com computational power of that magnitude, we can start to do things like model climate change, uh, build batteries that are much better and, and, and lead ourselves to a much more sustainable future. So I think that's the thing that excites me the most to your question. Yeah, absolutely. So it's the prediction ability, as you were just saying, the uh, the modeling and the modeling of potential scenarios, uh, almost real time. Because one thing is to model and say, okay, we're going to have, you know, the answers in a few years time. And by then climate change has moved on and continue to go the way we've been over the past few years. Or you can do it real time, assessing day to day, if not second to second, the data that is coming in. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And the natural world is a beautiful thing, right? The, if you study uh, things like fractals and uh, and uh, and other sort of um, universal uh, numbers in in, in the uh, in the in the natural world, it's it's an incredible. Uh, thing. The brain is an incredible thing as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, my first question, uh, when you said, you know, we can now in, in quantum uh, computing, we can be even faster, even smaller. And I'm just thinking, hang on, we have so much to get our heads around already, uh, not being digital natives, but maybe coming from a very different generation. What do we need it for? But it is true. I think the complexity, because we are global and everything is happening more or less on every level globally with every issue, um, you know, the faster we can sort of claw the data and come up with solutions is, is important. And also, if I hear you right, technology is a tool. So we've, we've got the structure and now comes the age potentially where we have to fill it with content, with making sense and having it really uh, be useful to whatever we want to create in a positive sense, right? Uh, yeah, abs absolutely, yes. And, you know, I, I say that, uh, you know, we live in a digital age, but the digital age is more than ever a human age. And the reason I say that is exactly as you described, Patricia. Technology is nothing more than a tool. It has no inherent value in and of itself. Um, it's what we uh, do with it that, uh, that matters, as is the case with any technology in, in history, from the most rudimentary, you know, the invention of the wheel to the printing press, etc. It's the application. It's people who brought that up. It's people who apply it. And it's people who use, uh, use that technology to... Um, you know, to uh, to do the uh, the things that are useful. Yeah, exactly. Useful or sometimes even not. And there's always the inherent fear that we become obsolete. We had it with the Industrial Revolution. We had it, of course, also also with, you know, the technology age. Um, you just mentioned well, about, you know... Can I come in on that? So, yeah. you, you, I mean, it's a great, it's a great uh, challenge, right? We had it with the Industrial Revolution. It turns out that the Industrial Revolution led to more employment, not less. 
Um, and the evidence that we see, um, the uh, econometric and, and uh, historical evidence that we see, is that this pattern will continue. Um, yes, there are certain things that computers will do a little bit better than we can do, and it's more efficient to have them do that, sort of think uh, repeatable tasks, things that require vast uh, data analysis and things like that. But it will also lead to new jobs. You know, I remember when I was growing up in the 70s, there was, uh, you know, there was a lot of controversy around the automation of manufacturing lines in um, auto companies. In you car companies, yeah. Robots, right? As well, people at least. Well, um, yeah, I mean, if, if your job was putting rivets in, you probably you needed to retrain and do something else. But it turns out, look, the auto industry is still thriving. Uh, the manufacturing base is bigger than it's ever been. It's moved. Uh, the jobs, types of jobs are different. And with the uh, advent, of course, of electric vehicles, it's heading in a brand new direction again. So I think that pattern will continue. And uh, we, we think uh, technology advancement uh, will, um, uh, will build new jobs uh, uh, faster than it uh, erodes old ones. I'm totally with you there. Absolutely. They may uh, have different skills, the employees of the future, but they are still going to be employed. And um, one thing you just uh, mentioned, and that is, you know, today, actually, uh, technology, the digital age is very human. And there I want to talk about um, your, your record label, the big community records, BCR, because it was actually technology that made you into some, you know, in, into an entrepreneur in that sector, but based on humans. T tell us how this came about. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's a, a, a personal example, I suppose. I, um, I suppose I, I noticed a, uh, an increasing sort of polarization in our society. In theory, um, it's never been easier to create a business or become a creator, a musician or an artist of some sort. Uh, to put your opinion out there as a, as a social commentator. Um, technology's enabled all of that, but it's also clear at the same time that um, whilst talent may be evenly distributed in society, opportunity is not. And that troubled, that troubled me deeply. And I wanted to dig in and, uh, and understand uh, why. So I started working with a couple of um, uh, young men who had less privileged backgrounds. They grew up in rough parts of, uh, of my uh, you know, adopted city in, in London. Um, and uh, they were teaching me. They were teaching me what life was actually like and, and why uh, that opportunity wasn't sort of getting through. Uh, and I asked myself, what can I do? What can I do? But personally, what can I do? Like Google can do some stuff. Charities can do some stuff. The government. But what can I do? It starts with us. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll help this one person. Uh, and his dream, Quasi Quartz his name, his dream was to be a musician. Um, he didn't know uh, how to do that. He got sort of drawn into this fairly uh, nefarious um, street life, uh, not because he wanted to, but, but because that's how he felt that he, he could give himself the means to, to do what he really loved. Um, that turned out, uh, you know, to be the, the wrong path for him. He had a couple of uh, tragedies in his life linked to that lifestyle, and he courageously withdrew himself uh, from that life and said, well, that's not my narrative. I'm going to do this the long and hard way. And we got introduced by a, a mutual friend over WhatsApp, actually. Uh, we met in person. And I thought, well, I invest in small businesses. Why didn't I think of this as a business and invest in this guy? So I came home. I Googled how to start a record label. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I found this company in Liverpool called Ditto, and they had this thing called Record Label in a Box. I'll have one of them. Uh, so Big Community Records was born, and I signed Quasi, and we set out to realise his dream, which was to do an album. Uh, we recorded and released that album in the middle of lockdown um, in July 2020. It's called Blood on the English Carpet. It's got eight tracks. We released it over 200 digital streaming platforms. Spotify, of course, is the, the biggest, uh, but many others. Uh, we did four music videos, which are released over, uh, over YouTube. Um, and we built a, a, a team around him. Uh, so I think this is a great example of, of, uh, of the humanity in the digital age. Although I, I sort of found Quasi and we were introduced over WhatsApp, I found how, how to start a record label by Googling it. Uh, we, uh, we recorded and distributed the music digitally over digital streaming platforms and, and YouTube, and subsequently we've been marketing it 
using social uh, social media, uh, this is a story about human connection at the heart. You know, had Quasi and I not connected, had uh, had we not assembled the brilliant team uh, around us, none of this would have happened. The technology still would have been there, but none of it would have happened. So I think, um, you know, I firmly believe technology is an enabler, um, but it's uh, but uh, but the digital age is more than ever a human age. Yeah, I, I uh, so agree. And it really is one of the best uh, examples I ever heard where you have the content, I quasis music, and your your brain power and willingness to somehow get involved as two human beings uh, with different skills, but the same motivation using what we have created over the past decade in terms of technology. Now, you're helping him also and, and their, your record label to be marketed via YouTube. How difficult is it really to get through the jungle? I think, Craig, there's about 500 million YouTube channels and you have one, I have one, and we're like, <laughs> Quasi has one. <laughs> so we're all fighting for attention. What's the key? Yeah, it's, it's really hard. I mean, reach these days is easy. We, we can both have YouTube channels, we can both release, release music. So reach is easy um, in, in theory. Uh, attention is very difficult because, it, as, you, as you say, Patricia, it's a really crowded space. There are something north of 40,000 tracks uploaded to Spotify every day. There are about 2 million music artists on Spotify, um, but only about the top 0.3% of them earn, you know, decent money, right? So it's, it's very much uh, an industry that's dominated by the names that, you and I would recognise by Ed Sheeran, Taylor Swift, Billie Eilish, uh, Stormzy, you know, uh, artists like this. But there's an awful, awfully large uh, torso and tail, if I could call it like that, um, who are brilliant, very creative, and really find it difficult to uh, to get noticed. So um, you, you really have to uh, approach it as a sort of horizontal strategy. Think of these different outlets, the digital streaming platforms, uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, uh, Google, you know, and, and the list goes on. These are all different canvases that you can paint with and reach people on, and all of them are good for different things. I'm, you know, I'm a Google guy, but I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm talking about uh, some some of our competitors here, and they're all, uh, you know, pretty much great companies in my opinion, and they're useful for uh, for different things. Uh, so uh, the the real art in music, right? The baseline is to produce something great, great music. You know that's necessary, but it's insufficient. Uh, what's necessary beyond that is to build an audience and a following that are really engaged and leaned into your story. And it's more about who you are as an individual, where you've come from, your narrative in a way, your relatability uh, that engages people. And uh, the more you engage you know, the easier it is to uh, to then monetize the art that you produce. It's not easy, though, at all. It's not easy at all. Community management and really having people on board and participating. I mean, one of the things I love about our medium, uh, medium, Craig, we both use is that you can really engage and people do tend to engage, but you have to follow up on it. I hear you. I see you. You know, there is technology between us, but you're you are close, you're part. And I think this is one of the key in keys perhaps to um, create this, this bond which goes beyond what whatever yeah you know, goes beyond the technology it really is about the humans and you just mentioned story yeah um, and that is something that you have with coffee eggs and inspiration your YouTube channel I think so almost two years or nine, 18 months old you launched that one out of the blue because uh, um, you have this value. And I'm flabbergasted, Craig. You want to meet two to three new people every week. I mean, wonderful, but how exhausting is that just to, you know, see them, choose them, and then talk to them. And this is how I think you also started to, to come up with the idea that whoever you meet has a great story because un extraordinary people have extraordinary stories behind them and share it. How do you go about really trying to meet two to three people a week, and then really pull value out of them and share that. Yeah, I, I think you, you say it's uh, exhausting. It must be exhausting. Actually, it's the opposite. I think I find it very energizing, actually. I get a lot of energy meeting new people. Um, it's lovely to meet you this week um, <laughs> on, on your YouTube channel. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I, I find whenever you sort of open yourself up to speak to somebody um, new, and the more different, the better, um, 
I tend to learn something. And, you know, life's about learning, isn't it, and, 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 and gathering experiences. And I hope that that, that fe feeling is mutual. Um, <laughs> maybe it's not always <laughs> in my case, but I hope it's... <laughs> well, thank you, Craig. No, no, no. You've done too much in your life. You're too interesting. I'm not interested. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah, so, um, and, and I get... Um, I'm very fortunate to be able to... Um, uh, to have the opportunity uh, to, to meet people. I'm very active on LinkedIn. That's my main uh, professional social media uh, platform. I love LinkedIn. And, um, and I, I love it because of the community uh, that it represents uh, and the connections that you can make. Uh, I don't use it for lead generation or anything like that. I use it just to start interesting conversations. And many of those conversations that start online uh, become you know, meetings in three dimensions. So most of the people I meet are connections of connections that I've already made, or uh, you and I met through a, a mutual connection, for example, or they are connections that came through through LinkedIn. And the idea behind Coffee, Eggs and Inspiration, my YouTube channel, is that, boy, I just, like, I, I had to pinch myself a few times. I'm sitting in front of this wonderful person um, being completely blown away by what she or he has done uh, and I'm an audience of one. Why don't I start to film these and share them, right? If there's at least one other person who might be interested in what these, uh, this, this person has to say, I've doubled the value of that conversation. Uh, so that's really the ethos and philosophy. I've started to experiment with different sort of content genres as, as well. But for me, it's sort of a plaything. You know, it's a, it's a hobby. I love it. Um, I, I, I do all of it myself. I could get people at... Uh, at YouTube and Google to help me, but I choose not to. I do all of the filming, editing, and distribution myself because it's a great learning experience. Well, that is chapeau because I know what is behind that. And I have to say, I, I do the production, I do the in-depth research, I do the recording, but and I cut it, but the marketing, I have engaged people. So I have about a team of four and it is still very hard. And you know, one of the things, and perhaps this is, I see a big parallel between your channel and mine is when I came up with the idea and I discussed it with friends, I said, oh, Patricia, it, it won't fly because you don't have a niche. All right. Uh, because you are interested in everything. So you've got the tech guy and then you've got the spiritual guy and then you have the brain science guy and then you have the nutritionist. And I'm like, yeah, but this is my interest. I mean, in one way, really, really selfish because it's all stuff. So stuff that interests me, which I think, you know, I get excited about have exciting people on and want to share it. Now, I just thought, you know, my niche really is to have these incredible minds from everywhere that can add value to whatever sector or, you know, demography, whatever you are in yourself, which is the mind expansion, which is a stay curious kind of mindset as well. And so that I think is my, is my niche, but maybe I'm completely wrong and I should just go down the road of, uh, you know, digital currencies or nutrition or having cold showers in the morning because it gets you out of the comfort zone. What do you think? Well, you'll figure it out. Uh, your audience will tell you what they like. They'll tell you through views. They'll tell you through engagement. Uh, and you'll figure it out. And, um, you know, and, and, and you'll find your way. I think above all, you know, I work with a lot of big YouTubers um, because YouTube's part of Google and I, I, I get to meet them in, in, in that way and also work with them outside. And there are a few sort of basic principles uh, of YouTube. One of the most important is to be authentic. Right. If you're sort of presenting something that's somehow not interesting to you, but, you know, popular, you know, people are smart. Right? <laughs> they, will, they will see that. And so I think you've got to genuinely be interested in the subject matter. Uh, and within that, uh, the, uh, the, the medium of, of YouTube is, is wonderful. It's a wonderful sandpit in a way because you can experiment with different, uh, different content, uh, different ways of editing, different ways of presenting through your thumbnails, et cetera. And you'll soon uh, figure out through the analytics on the back end what resonates and, um, uh, and what doesn't. I mean, I, 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 I uh, interviewed a YouTuber not so long ago, a guy called Zach Olsop. He's part of the Zach and Jay show. Check out the Zach and Jay show, awesome show. About a million subscribers. Uh, all right, okay. Wow. <laughs> right. But he, he, he gave me some great tips, right? And the, here are the basics. Um, think, think about authentic content, first of all. You've got to be interested in it. Second, um, thumbnail. A great thumb. You've got fantastic thumbnails. That's the little still image that you see that sort of is your uh, 
clickbait in a way. It needs to draw you in and uh, amongst the very many videos you could watch. Okay, that looks interesting um, and, and whatever it uh, says there. You know, the heading and title, the tags that you put beneath it because people search. YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. People search, right? So you need to give them something that uh, the search will hook onto. Um, the length uh, of, of the video is important. Watch time is amazingly important, but you've got to um, hook the audience in the first 10 seconds, right? So the advice that I got is uh, if you're doing a video, and I've only just started doing this recently, you need to say something like, in this video, I'm going to tell you about the wonderful world of NFTs. Let's go. Okay. So in that first uh, 10 seconds, the audience knows what they're going to get. And they've got a reason to to watch uh, watch the, the full content. But hey, at the end of the day, this is a this is a hobby. Uh, it's a passion, um, and you've got to have fun with it. Yeah, no. And Craig, by the way, the, the, your video on NFTs is great. <laughs> I love the line you said. Okay, if you have not been hiding under a rock over the last ten years, you should actually be known. What does I like that? And uh, I do agree. You know, with, with whatever you say, at the end of the day, it's still about sales. You know, this attention we talked about earlier on, and you need to hook the people with the, the your passion, the genuine message in the line. And yes, the thumbnail is very interesting. It's very important. And if I look at the big YouTubers, they have one face of perhaps the guest in like two or three words that 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 and that's it and i click you know and i click exactly. Easy, exactly. so I'm, I'm also still modeling on that one the last one on this one uh this conversation uh craig now there has been so much debate about social media being uh conducive to our social fabric or not being conducive to a social fabric. And I don't want to ask you as somebody that represents Google, not at all, but somebody who is, of course, into technology as much as I uh, I am using it for the good. But in, in terms of this, this generational gap between, you know, those people that say, Mm, it really is very bad. Dopamine dependency. Kids are getting weird. They can't even play together or talk together anymore, like uh, face to face. And the others say, no, it's not. It's it's really a great tool, depending on guiding somebody into it, how to use it properly. Where do you stand? Well, I think it can be both. I'm a dad. You know, I've got two teenage sons. One's 18, and the uh, the other one's 15. Um. And you know, I'm I'm like many others uh, in the leadership team at Google. I'm a I, I, I'm a parent. Uh, I, I think about uh, what's um, useful and wholesome uh, for our family and how to express those values in the way that we live. Uh, and um, and you know, we've got screen time rules, for example. Um, actually, there are a lot of tools uh, built into the platforms. Um, if you've got a Google account, there's you know settings that you can. Uh, you, you, you can use. There's a thing called Family Link, for example, where you can actually uh, manage that actively. And my own view is I think that's really important. I think like like any tool, um, we just happen to be in, in the age of social media at the moment. It's just another tool, like the protein press was. Uh, with any tool, it's important um, to be intentional, I think, uh, about the way it is, it, it is used. And it's uh, it's clear that um, you know the, there's a lot that's helpful uh, about social media, and I'm using that word really generically, right? Because social media means many, many different things, and they're not all the same. Um, but there's a lot that's helpful. You know, the uh, the movement um, that uh, that uh, you know Greta started around climate change, for example, was largely social media driven. I think that's a very, 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 very positive direction. The uh, case for modernizing um, Saudi Arabia is something that's largely propagated through uh, social media. Um, so there's clearly a lot of, uh, of positives, and there's also clearly um, a, a lot of negatives. And I think um, uh, all of the platforms are very uh, focused and, and conscious uh, on uh, doing all that they can to ensure that the uh, the um, you know, the, the darker sides are, are sort of mitigated and uh, at the end of the day, it, it needs to be um, helpful. And by the way, if it's not helpful, people wouldn't use it, right? So the fact that, that the facts speak for themselves, it's, uh, it's being used because it's helpful. Um, so look, I, I don't, you know, I have a Facebook account. I don't really use Facebook. Um, I, I use Instagram a little bit just for, um, 
for sharing photos. Um, you know, a lot of my family are in New Zealand. I think that's a really useful way of sort of having a, a shared sort of experience and, and keeping them uh, up to date. But I don't obsess about it. I use LinkedIn a lot. That's a very different animal, right? It's a it's a, a form of social engagement in a professional uh, context. And I'm very mindful, uh, both personally and with my family, about um, you know setting the right uh, boundaries and being intentional about how we use technology to um, make our lives richer rather than uh, rather than sort of distract us uh, from what's in front of us. No, absolutely, Craig. And you know, I look at it as connectivity, but selection. So, and the way to select what and who you connect to, I think is a potentially very important skill to teach ours. And I also have a teenage, one, one was enough, um, girl, 16 she is. And there we have this kind of balanced debate where she's very good in using her stuff as a tool. But of course, when it goes too much into toy and just engaging all the time, um, it could be, could be an issue. But I've heard many experts, there was a fantastic article in the Harvard Business Review also about that the positivity and the positive emotional experiences that our youngsters have through the connectivity, through the conversations they may hold is actually outweighing uh, everything of, you know, trying to be, I don't know, bullied or, you know, made feel not so beautiful because everybody else is so gorgeous. Well, Craig, such a pleasure to meet you. Thanks to technology. Thanks to a common, you know, a common acquaintance, Joe Binder, uh, or Binder, sorry, Joe Binder uh, from WOW, fantastic company he has. So I'm very happy, thanks to Joe, to, to get us together and for you to agree to join us here on Mentory TV. Shout out to Joe. Thanks, Patricia, for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you, my dear Mentory TV community, for having joined us yet again for an awesome, inspiring conversation. Why? Because you do stay curious, you're interested, and I hope to see you soon again. Bye.